welcome. It is good to see you. Uh, let me tell you, I'm very encouraged. Everybody is here. And, um, you know, on these Sunday nights, we have different things that we do uh, each week. And normally on the second and fourth Sundays, we do a deep dive in the book of Luke, which is primarily designed to teach you how to study your Bible. It is also to teach you, and I would love for you to come to those things. But I felt like uh, last night, as I was kind of thinking through, or in the last couple of days, maybe it was, as I was thinking through this topic, I thought, we need more time than what I can do on a Sunday to be able to unpack it. Now, next Sunday, I'm going to cover some different but similar things, so make sure that you're here next Sunday. Uh, and I actually will tell you that Sunday evening will be very similar next week. We will do this again next Sunday. The third weekend of every month is what we call leadership training. Uh, which is really for anybody, but next week we're going to focus our time, this 6.30 time next week, on how to train you to lead other people through a season of healing, okay? And so we're going to talk about that, so hopefully uh, you will make a really strong commitment to these, but my hope is that even after these two weeks you'll make a strong commitment to come on Sunday night because this is discipleship. This is a part of how we grow, how do we become the men and women that Jesus intends for us to be. And everything that we do here has significance and meaning. Uh, it just happens to be that this time we're going to focus in on a very specific topic. But there are lots of topics uh, that we can cover and lots of topics that we'll deal with next year. Uh, we will deal with more of these kinds of topics um, because they're practical, that we need them every day and to deal with these kinds of things. And so, for instance, next year we'll do a series on grief, which is different than what we're talking about here, and I'll explain that here in just a minute. Uh, but there's lots of things that we can cover, and, and so we're going to do that tonight. We'll do our best to keep it within an hour. Uh, we'll stop in an hour one way or the other, and then uh, if you need to talk more or whatever, we can do that. But uh, we will be done at 7.30 because many of you have kids that are back there, and we need to... Uh, have you get them in bed and we need to, our kid care workers to go home. And so we will be done on time when we're the other, although I will tell you, we most likely will not have covered everything I'd like to cover. And that's how it goes. I couldn't cover everything I wanted to cover this morning either. Uh, so this is kind of nice because they get to cover some other stuff. So maybe we should do that all the time. That's great. Uh, but anyway, well, thank you again for being here. I want to pray and um, I'm going to begin working through how to choose joy over despair. That's our goal, how to choose joy over despair. Okay, so let's pray. Father, it's a hard topic. It's a hard topic for me to deal with. It's a hard topic for us to hear and work through, but it's important because you call us to joy. Not just happiness. Happiness is such a circumstantial thing, but joy is a state of being regardless of what's going on around us. And so I pray that you will help us to understand joy and walk in it. That everybody here will be able to choose joy over despair because it is easy to despair. And so I pray tonight that you will speak through me and others that will share, that you will lead us in the way that we need to go, that you'll keep us from distraction, that you'll keep us focused, but ultimately we will understand what healing looks like, how we need to heal and begin that process, but also to help other people heal. And so help us to be those wounded healers. Help us to take the things that we hear tonight and share them with somebody else. And so I pray that you will teach us, that you will lovingly guide us into truth, and that you will strengthen us for this journey for the next hour. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. So ultimately... I want to um, help you learn how to practically walk out of depression and into joy. Now, to do that, though, I need a few disclaimers. I need to be able to give you some disclaimers, okay? The first disclaimer in how to uh, walk out of depression and into joy, the first one is that um, I'm not perfect at this. Uh, as I told you this morning, I've, I've gone through my own seasons of struggle and uh, at various times, uh, hopefully that makes you feel better. It's hard to uh, discuss that kind of thing. And, but let me just tell you that I'm not perfect at this. This is a work in progress. It's something that you learn and you grow into and you develop. There are some seasons that are easier than others. And so we get to do this together in many ways, okay? And I think that's fair. Uh, don't you think that's fair? 
Uh, we get to do this together. We can explore it together. Ultimately, we rely on Christ to lead us. And let me just tell you that what we're doing here, you can do with other people. You can do it on your own. It is really putting yourself in a place where you can learn from Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to teach you and lead you into different pathways, which is really what we're doing, what we're trying to focus on. The other disclaimer for you is I'm not a psychologist. I'm a theologian. And uh, that's different. And so I can't give you uh, the psychologist approach to things, but let me also tell you, I don't think there's anything wrong with going and seeing a psychologist. Uh, in fact, there's a point in here where I will tell you if you're at this particular place, you really need to go, in my opinion. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. You should. But let me tell you, I think you should be very careful if you go to counseling to not go to a secular counselor they will not give you the right tools to work with. They will give you behavior modification. And behavior modification is great. And it's a good tool to learn how to change behavior. In other words, when this happens, I respond this way. That's great. And we could learn those kinds of things. But unless it is in a Christian framework, you run some very significant risks of having them lead you down a path of transcendental meditation, new age philosophies that are tapping into chakras and energies and all that stuff, and it's demonic and dangerous. And I want to encourage you to be very careful of that. There are Christian counselors, even in this town, that I recommend that I've spent um, time interviewing and talking to uh, so that I can recommend. And one of those uh, people is right here uh, in Cabot, and there's some brochures up here that she got me. So if you need a little extra help, First of all, let me take away the stigma for you and tell you don't let, it, um, don't let that be a stigma for you. If you need to go talk to someone, you should go talk to someone, okay? There's nothing wrong with that, just like we have a recovery ministry on Monday nights. Some of you need to come to that. That will actually help you uh, find some healing. And so there's nothing wrong with that. It's good. You should do that. And again, if you need those, those will be up here for you for tonight. Um, and so I'm going to do the best I can from a theological perspective to navigate some of this. A lot of it, though, does come out of uh, pastoral counseling, which is not the same as uh, a psychologist. Pastoral counseling, I have been trained, but it's different uh, than what a psychologist can lead you through. And, um, and I wanna, the last thing I want to say about that is that I also believe there are times that medication is okay and good. And I want to take that stigma away as well. So often I've heard uh, pastors say, or I've heard other people say that a pastor told them that if you take medicine uh, for depression, there's something wrong with you. You just need to pray more, get your faith in check. I got to just tell you, I think that's ridiculousness. And here in a minute, I'm going to have uh, my wife, uh, Jennifer, who's a nurse practitioner, come up and address some things along that line. Uh, but I want you to be able to hear the truth in that and there's a time for that. Okay, so the first thing then, so those are my disclaimers. Everybody good with that? All right, so the main thing I wanna cover to begin with is defining depression. Uh, let me tell you, it's hard to do. It's really hard to define such a thing, uh, partly because there are lots of forms of depression. Uh, there are lots of causes of depression and various things that lead up to that. Uh, and depression can vary from mild to severe. Uh, so there's, it's all over the board. And those are the kinds of things that if you're really struggling, you can work through some of that with a professional. But here's where you of often can understand, understand depression best by how it uh, impacts you, by how it affects you. So you tell me, now I need to repeat it because we are recording tonight. Uh, what are some of the ways that depression affects people? So raise your hand and I'll call on you and you just tell me. Not, not long sentences, one word or two, but how does depression affect people? You don't find joy in the things that used to bring you joy. Okay, you don't find joy in the things that used to bring you joy. Yes? Mood changes. Mood changes? Eat too much or eat too little. Eat too much or eat too little. It does impact that. Yes? It makes it hard to do daily things like get mm -hmm. out of bed, shower, and wash dishes. Okay, it can affect daily functionality. Yep. Sometimes isolate, isolate yourself. We talked about that today. Yep. It can absolutely affect relationships with family, with friends. Uh, for sure, it can affect and impact relationships. What else? Hmm? Can definitely affect your relationship with God. 
absolutely. So there's lots of those, and I wrote down some, and you guys hit them all, I think, but can affect your appetite. Again, one way or the other, not eating at all or eating too much. Uh, we'll talk about the eating too much thing here in just a little bit as uh, some of the dangers of self-medication around this kind of thing. Uh, sleeping, either not enough or too, mi too, uh, uh, too little. Energy, how you think, how you concentrate, even your image of yourself, your self-worth, what you believe about yourself. Uh, often we create false narratives about my sense of belonging, uh, what value I have in the world often can be impacted and affected when someone is depressed. Or really what that does is it tells you, you might be depressed if you have this view that I'm worthless, I'm not good for anything, I'm not good to anything, I'm just not useful in any way. And so often that perspective of self-image and self-worth are impacted uh, in dramatic ways. Now, uh, I'm going to invite Jennifer up here to share a few things. I'm going to share my microphone with her, um, but I want her to come up and tell you some things about some other causes of this, uh, and then we're going to work through some other stuff. Uh, you know, as I think through it, uh, I know that there are thyroid conditions that can impact it. Uh, low testosterone in men can impact it. Some of those kinds of things. But there are other things that I think um, Dr. Jennifer can give us and tell us uh, that are useful. So let me just hold this for All you. All right. Okay, you can hold it. Jimmy, hold it. Yep. I'd rather hold it. I'll, I'll just like stand here closely. It, so. Yes. All right. Well, as Spencer said, it's it can be very multifactorial. So, you know, you can have, of course, the psychological aspect, but there's physical aspects, which I'll hit on, as well as spiritual aspects. So depression is not just one thing. It can come from many different causes. And I'm just going to kind of touch on... Uh, some of the physical side of that that can lead to it or uh, that could be causing some of your symptoms. And there's other medical professions here uh, in the room and this is, might be some information that you already know. But uh, historically, of course, there's been a stigma uh, for depression and other psychological disorders for a long time in our society. But I will say, if you think of it as um, if you were to have an infection in your body, are there infections in your body that you can fight off? Yes, you absolutely can. Are there infections in your body you cannot fight off? Mm -hmm. Yes. And I kind of look at depression the same way. There's times where you might be able to work through that season. You can work through it with God. You can work through it with friends or with a counselor. But there are other seasons where it could be an actual biochemical thing that you cannot move on and that you need help with. Just like there's times where you may need an antibiotic because your body defenses are down and your body cannot help you fight the infection, there are times where you may need to tap in some type of chemical help uh, through what a doctor would prescribe to help you uh, with the biochemical side that you need in your brain to help you move through um, that depression. And um, other psychological illnesses can be the same thing too. Um, Spencer kind of touched on it just a minute ago, but you know, if your thyroid is uh, hormones are not working properly, it can lead you to depression. If you have low testosterone or other hormones in your body, if you have particular types of diseases, so let's say you've had a stroke, you've had Parkinson's, you have MS, lots of those different types of things can lead to depression symptoms, as well as if you are taking medications, some, some of those can have side effects that can lead you to depression. Or maybe you're just sleeping all day and you're thinking, wow, maybe I'm depressed because I'm sleeping all day. Well, it could also be side effect of your medications. And so those are just things that you have to keep in mind is that there could be also some underlying physical causes that are fixable. And so not to uh, further despair, but you do need to go meet with your doctor and to get that checked out, uh, have some blood work run and that will help. Yes. Yeah. Our doctor. <laughs> common, common comorbidity with depression is an anxiety disorder. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. It's very common to have anxiety and depression together. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's just important that you get those things looked at to see, make sure, is there anything underlying like a side effect or a chemical issue that might be the cause or something, you know, just get some blood work done. Is it a hormone? To make sure that there's not something that could be fixed in a different way. And I've known people that uh, had uh, terrible depression as well as they just were sleeping all the time and it was their thyroid. 
And as soon as they get on medication, it's amazing that, you know, how they perk up. So that could be part of it. Um, and then if you are, have already been trying to self-medicate with alcohol, drugs, things like that, guess what? You can actually be doing more harm because some of those are depressants. And so those could be actually making your problem worse if you're trying to self-medicate uh, with alcohol and drugs. So that's about all I'm going to say. Roger, do you have anything else you want to add? Okay. Roger okay. is our physician. So. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for letting me stand uncomfortably close to you <laughs> while you... <laughs> Uh, so that's, but you know, at least we're married, so that's good. Okay, so I'm not gonna be able to fix that. And we'll put it on there. Yeah. So what what was just said is that often, depending on what's actually going on, there are uh, different medications that can affect one side or the other. More anxiety, more depression. Some that deal with both, but there are often different things that are going on there that need to be addressed and um, and there's 20 different medications they can use for that kind of stuff and sometimes it's a little trial and error but if that's something you need to do then there should be no stigma about it but again I think the important part of that is if you're struggling in some area a good place to start is your primary care physician and just tell them this is what's going on let them do some blood work and see again there may be something else that's going on that actually depression is just a byproduct. It's not the underlying issue. There may be an underlying issue there uh, that can uh, be fixed very easily with some medication that can bring uh, a lot of uh, very quick, in many cases, um, changes. Yep. Yeah, they also, there, there, are, uh, there are surveys that are THQ-9 survey that, that a lot of doctors will give you as a screening test. Yes. Yep. And so you're, again, your primary care physician can give you some screening tests, ask you the right questions and find out what's really going on there. Um, a couple of other things, and then we'll get into some practical steps on how to deal with this. Of course, one of those practical steps could be medication, depending on what's going on. That's a really practical step. Don't let that freak you out. Uh, but let me say this, that uh, depression often is different than sadness and grief. We all get sad. We all get sad about different things, and it's fair to be sad. God gave us emotions for a reason, and um, there are seasons of life where we may be more sad. That does not actually mean you're depressed. Um, it may just mean that you're sad, uh, that you may be grieving something that you have lost. Grief often can lead to a time of depression if that grief uh, doesn't resolve, if you can't get through it, uh, and often grief and depression will run hand in hand. But uh, grieving also is a normal process that we all go through if we have lost something. Uh, and by the way, that's not just in death. That's not the only thing that we grieve. We grieve all kinds of things that we've lost. I'll be honest and tell you, I have grieved cars that I've sold. I'm a car guy, and there have been cars that I've sold along the way, and I cried about it after I let that car go, going, why did I sell that car? You know, that kind of thing. We can grieve any kind of loss. And some of our losses are small, and we can grieve them very easy. Some of our losses are really big. And if we cannot easily get control of that, and often the reason we don't get control of grief is because we don't understand it. Many people will say, I feel like I'm going crazy. And that's their response to grief. Well, really, it's not going crazy. It's just that you're having uh, emotions that are coming in and out. So let me just say a couple quick things about grief, because it often can either lead to depression or, or it can actually be the underlying cause of it. And that is, uh, the way I explain grief is it's like a rubber band ball. And everybody knows what a rubber band ball is, right? It's all a bunch of rubber bands all uh, wound around one another. Well, imagine creating a rubber band ball and on every rubber band, you write a different emotion. Uh, and there's all kinds of them. Maybe that emotion, one of the bands is uh, frustration. Maybe one of them is anger. Maybe another one is happiness. But the one right behind that one is um, guilt. And a lot of people that are grieving, if they feel happy, they feel guilty about it. Uh, and what happens often if you're actively grieving is you get up in the morning and you just start peeling rubber bands off. And it's random and you could have 20 different emotions in 20 minutes. And it's all over the place and it feels like a roller coaster because it is. When you're actively grieving a loss, it really is all over the place. And you can't control it. It is just what's going on in you. Um, the books that are out there, there are lots of good books, by the way. Uh, we can make some recommendations. Terry Cox can make some recommendations. Um, there are lots of good books on grief, but I will tell you the ones that say it's linear and you will go through this and then this and then this and then this 
are lies. It is not reality. That is make-believe. It'd be awesome if that were the case because you could get up in the morning and go, awesome, I'm, I've done these five things, so here's what's coming next. No, if you've done these five things, it means the next one may be anger, wanting to punch a hole in the wall, screaming, numb, and then numbness sometimes is welcome. Sometimes we love to be numb when it's really all these other emotions, but we go in and out of it. Here's the deal. You're not crazy when you're grieving. That's what grief looks like. You're not crazy, but you do have to go through it to get through it. There's no magic solution to it. If, we were, if this were a class on grief, we would tell you you have to go through it to get through it. And a couple of things you have to do is give yourself permission to feel how you feel. If you feel angry, be angry, but don't sin in that anger, right? If you feel numb, be numb. Don't make yourself numb. But if you feel numb to it, be numb. If you feel happy, be happy. Give yourself permission to feel how you feel. And then the people around you who are grieving, maybe the same loss, but grieving differently, they will grieve also, but they may grieve totally different timing than you. So give yourself permission to feel how you feel and give them permission to feel how they feel. When you can do that well, it actually will alleviate a lot of depression and sadness that comes alongside of that. But these are in many, many times intermingled with one another. So let me ask you, how many of you have seen the movie, What About Bob? Yeah, just this side of the room, no? Okay, uh, it's an interesting, I was, I'm really surprised. I figured more of you had seen the movie. Uh, it's Bill Murray, and uh, he has some uh, interesting psychological uh, challenges. He goes to see a psychiatrist. Uh, the psychiatrist gives him sort of a, an idea of what to do, and then the psychiatrist says, but I'm, not, I'm going on vacation for a month. And wh what happens is Bill Murray tracks him down on vacation and is continuing to go, but what about this and what about this? Anyway, uh, ends up blowing up his house and all kinds of crazy stuff. It's a funny movie. Uh, what now? Richard Dreyfus is the psychiatrist, right, right, which makes it even more interesting. He has puppets and everything. Puppets is great. Uh, anyway, so the point of that is in that book where he's dealing with this man with psychological disorders, he had just finished writing a book. Does anyone remember? You can have a free piece of candy out of the bowl if you know the answer to this. Does anyone know what the title of the book was in the movie? Baby Steps. Baby steps. Points for you, Thomas. All right, good. So here's the deal. Uh, eat all the candy you want. Uh, baby steps. So today, here's what we want to do. We want to take some baby steps, partly because we don't have time to go into more. So what I want to do is give you some very practical things we can work through and you can understand and begin to process through today and begin to work through that. And so some baby steps. So here's where we're going to start. I want to ask you uh, if you want to share this you don't have to. I also want to say there's no assumption that because you're here you're wildly depressed and struggling. Hopefully there are people here that are not depressed and you're here because you want to help someone you love work through it and that's good and that's fair. Again, many of us may be wounded healers too where we've been through it but we're on the other side of it and we want to help and give some tools and sometimes it's hard to explain it. Sometimes you just go through a season and there are seasons of life that are harder than others at times. Do we agree with that? And sometimes you could be really sad or really grieving, or maybe that sadness lasts for months and it's more of a depression thing. But at some point you climb out of that deep, dark hole and you find light again and all that stuff lifts away. And often people may not even know why. It just happens to sort of filter away. It just depends on circumstance. So for whatever reason that you're here, I'm glad that you're here, but we need to ask this really hard question and we won't have time for everybody to share. We're not gonna go around the room, only if you want to, raise your hand though so I can call on you. And that is finish this sentence, when I am depressed, I feel. So tell me, when I'm depressed, I feel. Tired, Tired. I heard numb over here. Alone, hopeless, worthless, irrational, irrational. Totally, misunderstood. totally misunderstood, it's good, angry, angry. Useless. useless, okay, now let's do this one, what triggers it, what are the things that in the past, have triggered this place of 
sadness or overwhelming sadness that doesn't go away, a depression, what is it that triggers it? Role change. A role change. Very good. Irrational beliefs. Irrational beliefs. Good. I want to come back to role change just for a second. Um, postpartum depression often is a role change. Um, that's postpartum depression is really common. Um, some of that can be biochemical with hormones changing, uh, but a lot of it for a lot of people, it's because their role changes. Uh, they've gone from living in this world and now all of a sudden you have this little parasite sucking life out of you, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and, uh, and, but it, that's how it feels sometimes. Am I right or am I, I, I'm right, you know I'm right. And so uh, it's just got to call it what it is. It's what it feels like sometimes. And, and so literally and figuratively sucking the life out of me we love them but why are we so you know um, postpartum depression is often a role change even if it's temporary and you go back to work 12 weeks or whatever it's still it's like I used to do these things and now I can't or I used to do this for a living and now I can't those sorts of things that that is a very real real thing that's super common the other thing I wanted, I meant to mention earlier, I mentioned it very briefly in the sermon this morning, seasonal affective disorder is off, also very common, where it is the change in seasons. We get into this time of year and it's dark at five o'clock. I hate that. Why in the world, when I'm president, I will totally change that daylight savings time thing. Um, it would be executive order. That's stupid, going away. Anyway, uh, when it gets dark at five o'clock and there's less daylight anyway, a lot of people struggle. I'll tell you, there were times in my life, well, I'll, actually when I taught um, high school, I had an internal classroom, so it meant I had no windows, which never made any sense because I, I had a huge chemical lab and I could blow stuff up every day. Why would they put you in an internal classroom? You want those people on the outer edges so when something really goes, they don't affect everybody. Still, I didn't, I didn't build that building. Uh, so uh, I would be in this classroom and often I would get there early in the morning before anybody else, you know, any of the kids would get there. It's usually mostly dark when I would get there. I would teach all day long and then be busy with meetings or whatever. And by the time I left, it was dark again. There were literally days I would not see daylight. Guess what? That is not good for Spencer. That is not good for Spencer. Uh, seasonal affective disorder is real when um, seasons change, but also part of that is even routine changes. You know, we talk about life, uh, you know, changes of what's going on, but I think even routine changes can throw us off and get us into a place where we're not just sad, but that sadness just doesn't go away. And it lasts for weeks or months at a time. Uh, seasonal affective disorders are real. Uh, being aware of it also, just really quick, how can you fix seasonal affective disorder on your own? What are some things that you could do? Light therapy. What'd you say, Dixie? It was my favorite answer. I heard it. Go to the beach. What are you guys doing tomorrow? Uh, let's do a road trip. We got a bus. Let's see how many of you. you uh, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, being purposeful to get outside. Get outside. Even if it's cold, get out in the sunlight. Synthesize some vitamin D, that kind of thing. But doing some of those things are necessary. Exercising. That will help you a lot if you exercise um, because it has a natural effect on endorphins and all that, which is good, by the way, as a baby step for all depression and things. If you can manage to get yourself up and go exercise, it can help, it can. And so seasonal affective disorder, totally real, uh, and um, you can work through it, uh, but you need to be aware of it. And I think most people are not even aware of it, that, that that's a thing, but it is a real thing. Okay, so let's answer, uh, let's go back to our question. What triggers it? So we talked about life stage uh, changes, routine changes. What triggers or what have you experienced it as triggers for depression? Weather. Weather, okay. Stress. stress. Long seasons of stress where it just doesn't seem to go away. Anybody in here ever had a long season of stress and just didn't go away? Anybody? Uh, when that happens, we can be sad when we go through a stressful period. But again, when that sadness does not go away and that sadness lasts for weeks or months, we're no, probably no longer in the sad category. We're in that struggling with some depression category uh, and it can happen that way. What else? Disease. Disease. Okay. 
Diagnosis of things, that can definitely affect it. What else? Chronic pain, absolutely, causes depression. When you hurt every day, it is easy to feel hopeless. Uh, like, when is this going to go away? When is this going to change? Uh, and there are lots of medical conditions that cause that daily pain, and that absolutely in many people, not everybody, many people can cause depression. Yes? Unrealistic goal setting. <laughs> That's good. Setting yourself up to be depressed. Setting yourself up for failure, unrealistic goal setting. Uh, absolutely. And then when we don't reach it, then we can struggle. Absolutely. What else triggers it? Fear. Fear. That's good. Often that false evidence appearing real, but there are some real things that we could be afraid of at times. Repeated trauma. Repeated trauma. Going through, um, for instance, we'll just call it out. This may be not what you're thinking, but um, abuse, ongoing abuse, uh, that kind of trauma can trigger depression for sure where you're always thinking it's never going to get better i'm always going to deal with this and that causes in many cases uh, a, a depression i saw a hand over here somewhere yes sudden. sudden loss okay and so that grief can lead into depression if we're not grieving well and again back to grief you have to grieve well when you have a loss uh, I, I actually mentioned this in the funeral I did on Monday, which was um, uh, people uh, will say, you know, don't cry for me. Or I've heard pastors say, you know, uh, he, so and so wouldn't want you to cry. I got to tell you, that is the stupidest thing you can say uh, to someone or in a funeral. It is OK to cry. Give yourself permission to cry. If you cry, if you want to cry, cry. There's no rules. So it's OK. If you want to laugh, laugh. There's no rule to that. But it's when we try to stuff those things inside and because we've been told they're inappropriate to think. That's why I'm part of what we did today on Sunday is deconstruct some of the, uh, some of the you know, things that people have heard before in their lives. Uh, if you tuck all that stuff in and stuff it in, often that can result in depression. Just a couple more. What are other things that trigger? Yep. Rejection. Okay, very good, uh, especially if you're rejected by uh, someone that you really love. We talked about it briefly today, Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, my, one of my favorites. Uh, I held it together way better second service than I did first service. I kept having these twinges right here in my throat. I want to cry. But Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, he was sad, he was lonely, but he was rejected constantly, constantly rejected. And that can absolutely create that. I saw a hand over here. Yeah, last one. Stacking. Stacking. Yeah, so uh, stacking is a term I love to use when I counsel people. We have one problem, one frustration, and then we add another problem or frustration, another one, another one, another one, till the stack's this big, and then a feather can touch the top of that, and it all comes crashing down, collapses, if we're not doing a good job of removing some of the stacks, which is what we're doing now. We're trying to remove some of the stacks. Okay, so here's the thing. If you can figure out some of the things that are triggering that's deep sadness and depression, then you're miles ahead. If you know the things that trigger you and you can work hard to avoid some of those, it's going to help you a lot. But unfortunately, we can't avoid all of them, right? Some of those things that happen are things we cannot avoid, but there are things that we can avoid that will trigger us. And let me tell you, the first baby step is protect your eyes and your ears. Protect your eyes and your ears. One of the things our children grew up hearing from me is, once you see it, you cannot unsee it. Once you hear it, you will always think of it, and that's important. Now, we can take thoughts captive and all that, but here's really ultimately what I mean by protecting your eyes and your ears. Um, you can watch different movies that will trigger your depression. You can watch TV shows, if you are, and you can watch the news. <laughs> If you are a news junkie, you run a high risk, I think, of being depressed because everything on the news is bad. It's intended to be. Guess what? Good feely stories don't make it to the news most of the time because that's not what sells the news. Death and destruction and dismemberment, that's how the news gets sold. And if you spend all day long watching the news, you are putting yourself into a position and you're setting yourself up for failure to be constantly inundated with dark, depressive things. 
And so the thing that actually is maybe an issue is ends up being secondary, but we end up putting stuff into us all the time that can put us in a wrong position or set us up just right to really st struggle with depression. If you're watching movies where everybody's getting killed all the time, everybody's getting abused all the time, that can trigger past memories or whatever, but also it's just stuff that plagues your mind. And I don't know about you, but there are things that I've watched that like to sneak out in my dreams or in my subconscious thoughts as I'm pondering life or whatever, and it's just some stupid movie or TV show, I need to encourage you to quit watching crap. Quit it. Draw a line in the sand and quit watching things that are full of profanity and full of sexual innuendos or sexual things in general. Quit watching the stuff that is violent and that is murder, death, and dismemberment. You've got to stop. It will not help you. I have heard from many people that stuff doesn't affect me anymore. Baloney. It will affect you subconsciously at the very least. You need to protect your eyes uh, from those things. I'm about to go there. Yep. Right. So it's right here in my notes. Uh, on <laughs> protecting your ears. Good job. You get a piece of candy. Candy for you. Candy for you. Uh, you need to protect your ears. And... Um, one of the things you got to protect yourself from is stupid music. Um, if you now, <laughs> okay, so because Dixie said it, I will say it. Be, <laughs> um, uh, I'm, I'm having a hard time saying this without overgeneralizing. Uh, but you know as well as I do, how many of you listen to country music? I, I know some of you are ashamed to raise your hand. It's okay, you can raise your hand. Uh, if you listen to it, often a lot of that music is about depressive things. Uh, it just is. If you listen to uh, various kinds of modern music, it's the same thing. It's about evil, disgusting things. And those lyrics go into us and we remember them. And what you put into you will come out of you. It is true. This is a spiritual thing as well as anything. What comes out of you is an indication of what is in your heart. And if foul, evil things are coming out of you, it's because you have purposely put stuff in your heart or you've been exposed to things in the world that you couldn't control. That's also possible, especially when you're a child. We get exposed to all kinds of things we don't have any control over. But if you continue to fuel that with music that has lyrics that are terrible and you're watching things that are terrible, um, you're setting yourself up to struggle um, and, and be depressed. You can. And some music is actually designed to be depressive. The music is designed that way. Like the blues. There's a point to what the blues are and how they sound and all of those things. I've done this with my children. We love music. I love music. Um, music says something by itself even without the words. Uh, one of the things I loved to do was classical music with our children. We were in the car and I would play a section of a song and I'd say, how does this music make you feel? Even when our kids were little, it was always intriguing to listen to them say, well, it makes me feel sad right here. But here I hear this, you know, this really happy little tune. It makes me feel happy. It's, it's unbelievable the things that we can put into us that will affect us and come out of us. And so we need to be really careful. So baby step number one is protect your eyes and your ears. Um, <clears throat> some other baby steps I want to encourage you to do are uh, to journal. Now, I am terrible at this by myself. I am. I'm terrible at this, but I do know it's the right thing. Um, journaling is great for several reasons, uh, especially with people that are grieving. We will often tell them you need to write those things down. One of the best ways that you can heal from things is to get it out of you. This is why going to a psychiatrist or psychologist is beneficial. Why having someone that you uh, are safe with, that you can share things with, is beneficial. Because you can talk through things and just being able to say it and get it out of you often is very healing. And so the things that have triggered you, the things that have sucked you in, the things that have brought you into a place of darkness... If you can communicate it, and by the way, sometimes there are no words for it. 
Sometimes you just can't communicate it. Words don't do it justice on what's going on, or we just don't have words to be able to articulate it. Part of what we've done tonight, even in talking about what triggers you and what are the kinds of things that you see and experience, it helps give you language to be able to communicate it, to get it out of you. Uh, so for grief or um, depression or sadness, quit bottling it up. I know some of you have been taught that you don't share your problems with everybody. Um, guess what? You may not share it with everybody, but you should have one or two people that you trust that you can share the deep, dark places of your soul with. And if you don't, you need to go see a psychologist and share it with them. You need to. Quit bottling it up because bottling it up unfortunately often creates an explosion at some point. Um, just like if you were to take a bottle of soda and shake it up and shake it up and shake it up and then throw it on the ground, at some point it's going to explode. Uh, you're no different. You've got to have an outlet to be able to communicate it, articulate it. And sometimes good, it's good to verbally do it, but sometimes you need to journal it and write it down. Now, I know people are always afraid if I write it down, someone might find it, all that. And so, again, in our, sometimes in our grief counseling, we'll tell you, write it out and then burn it. Or write it out and then go out in the middle of nowhere, read it and then burn it if you need to, or whatever. But, but writing it down forces you to slow down and it forces you to think through it and be able to write it out. And you should do that. Okay, another baby step is do not avoid your quiet time with God. Now, this is the spiritual side that I want to say that uh, spiritual disciplines are vital to you. Uh, spiritual disciplines are what I talk about a lot in the second of our connection classes, uh, the grow class. How we, how we develop and mature as disciples is a lot about spiritual disciplines. If you have not been to that class, you need to come. I will teach you how to spend time alone with God, give you a, a framework and a pathway but one of the best things you can do is spend quiet time with God, uh, get alone with God, and to practice being still, uh, to read your Bible in a purposeful way, to pray the best that you can. Ultimately, spiritual disciplines, I prefer the term soul care, because most of us don't like the idea of being disciplined. We don't want to go to discipline, although discipline is okay when you, if those of you that have kids, when you disciplined your children, you probably didn't do it because you hated them. You discipline them so they wouldn't grow up and be jerks. And so God disciplines us at times. Um, so don't be afraid to experience some discipline, especially spiritual disciplines. But ultimately what you're doing is soul care by practicing things like being still, practicing solitude, especially for those of us that are extroverts. It's hard, but it's good. It's good and healthy. Journaling is a spiritual discipline or it can be part of your soul care. If you're not doing a good job of taking care of your soul, you will struggle. You will struggle. If you're not spending time consistently with God, you will struggle. You just will. And some of you in here could solve a lot of your depression if you would spend time with God, if you would consistently do it. And I'm not preaching at you. I'm not always good at it. Depends on what's going on. Because here's the truth. When you're in a deep, dark place, the last thing you want to do is go read your Bible. Or the last thing you want to do is pray. Guess what? That's part of why we call it a spiritual discipline. The people that are super good at working out, I don't know how that would actually work, but the people that are really good at that, they'll go work out if they're sick. They'll go work out if it's sleeting. They'll go work out whenever if they are disciplined. Same people, same type of thing if people are, you know, disciplined about how they eat. Again, I don't understand it, but people that are, they're disciplined about it. And yet, very few people are disciplined to really spend time alone with God. But if you would, I'm telling you, uh, and it's not just the churchy answer. It's a real answer. It is a real and genuine answer that if you would get time with God and you would shut your mouth, quit talking, and be still before the Lord, read scripture, do a daily devo, go to Bible gateway or download the um, Bible app. If you don't know how to do it, I'll show you afterwards. We can do it together. I'll show you. you there's a thousand different uh, studies and devos that you can do. And you can look up depression. You can look up anxiety. You can look up all sorts of those things. 
and become a student. Here's part of that. Become a student of that depression. Become a student of it. Understand it better. When you understand what's going on and you are walking through it purposefully, you are more likely to heal than if you sit back and go, I just don't understand. I just don't know. I don't know what it is. Take the time to learn. Take the time to know. Do the devos on it from people that have walked through uh, the dark night of the soul and have come out on the other side. Part of that's being that wounded healer we talked about this morning. Take the time to become a student of it and to grow into it and study the scriptures that have to do with it. If you really want help, please don't send me a text later tonight. This says, can you send me all the scriptures on um, sadness? Uh, my answer for you is going to be no. Google can, though. If you go to Google, I promise you, if you look up Bible verse sadness or Bible verse grief or Bible verse depression, there will be all kinds of things you can read. And you should do that. You are equipped to do it. Or use your Bible app or go to BibleGateway.com and those kinds of things. The point of all of this is soul care. Practice spiritual disciplines. Practice them every day. It will help bring the healing that you need. Um, a few other little things. If you disconnect from God, you'll feel it. If you disconnect from God, you'll feel it. If you disconnect from other people, you'll feel it. You need to be disciplined to not disconnect. You need to find people that you are safe with and spend time with them. And as I said this morning, give them permission to call you out gently and lovingly, but give them permission to come drag your behind out of bed and make you eat something, just like God sent the angel to Elijah. This is good. Give people permission to do it. Uh, here at Renew, I've given people permission to call me out if I say something mean, uh, if I do something um, that's weird. I have people that I trust that can call me out on it. And the same would go for anything, that if you get to a deep, dark place, the people that love you the most will know it and you need to give them permission to come after you and tell you how to deal with it. Uh, I've, I have said to people uh, whom I love very much, if I get to a, a frustration place, you need to come after me. You need to come to my house and go, hey, I have noticed that you are awful frustrated lately. We need that. Of course, you can do it with your spouse. Uh, sometimes, in my experience, sometimes when the spouse is the one who calls you out, it's a little harder to take sometimes. Um, but when it's some, <laughs> amen, <laughs> it's good to have a spouse that can hold you accountable. But if you're like Jennifer and I, if we try and hold each other accountable to eat right, one of us is going to give in and ask the other one if we really want to cheat. The answer is yes, and we will. <laughs> and so... Um, uh, <laughs> So we're not great accountability partners for each other. But if she were to come to me and say, look, you are in a dark place. I don't know what's going on with you. I tend to, just being honest, I tend to respond negatively out of frustration. Like, how dare you say that to me? Um, leave me alone. That's ridiculous. And where's that coming out of? It's coming out of a depressive place. That's why I would react that way. But if one of my friends came to me and said, dude, what is your deal? Here's what I notice going on with you. I am probably less likely to act like a jerk like that. Now, depends on the day. But you need to be purposeful before you leave here tonight and determine, is there a person that can be my person that I can call 24-7, 365, that will help rescue me if I need it? You need these people in your life. If you don't have them, you need to be at Life Group on Wednesday night and begin building that relationship with somebody. It takes time. Like I said today, if you wait until you're in a deep, dark hole to try and build community, you probably won't. You'll be too uh, tired and too frustrated to build a sense of community. So while you're able to function, build that community now and have support system that is in place. And you know that you've got that person you can call at three in the morning and go, I want to give up. You need it. All of you do. This is part of the baby step. Develop the relationship so you have those people. Um, fuel the Holy Spirit. Again, continue to study, continue to read, continue to pray, continue to worship. Worship will help you a lot. Start out your day with a spiritual discipline of worship. Turn on the music before you get out of bed if you need to. And begin uh, allowing 
worship to fill you instead of uh, dark thoughts and frustrations, okay? Um, meditate on music. Take the time to actually look up the words. What are the words to the song? Again, it blew me away, and it happens a lot here. Uh, it really does. It happens a lot. You may think that we coordinate songs with sermons. Uh, almost never does that actually happen. And today I was standing there listening to those last three songs, which I didn't even know what the songs, I honestly didn't even know what, for first service, I didn't know what was even coming up. No idea. Uh, I got here this morning, they were practicing, but I was out. I had my checklist, I was doing things. I wasn't paying attention. I was blown away when I stood there and looked at the words and went, wow. Even words like crushed, that was in one of the words. And I thought, I said that word, I feel crushed. Um, but going through those things, Pay attention to the words. Don't just pay attention because it has a nice melody. Pay attention to the words. By the way, that will also teach you that some worship songs are not very biblical. We're very careful to not do those here. There are some of my favorite songs and how they sound. I've got them on my phone and they say a couple goofy things. It's like, well, can't do that at Renew. Good job, Matt Redman. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> Had to say that one dumb thing uh, or good job, Hill song. Thanks for that, whatever. Um, there, uh, you know, uh, pay attention to the words and let those words fuel you because the words that need to stick out in your mind, not just the tune. But if you've got a tune in your head, hey, here's one of the little baby steps. If you've got a tune in your head that you can't get out of your head, go look up the words. It actually may be God's way of saying, you need to hear something from me. And you may think, I just can't get the song out of my head. I keep saying, I keep singing. I just, I hear Dixie singing this song all the time in my head. Or I hear Terry sing a song in my head. Or whatever. It actually may be God going, I need you to go look up the words because I've got something to say to you. And do that. You can learn a lot from the music. You really can. You can learn a lot. The music's not there to entertain you. The music is there to lead you into the throne room of God. So stop waiting just for Sunday to do it. If you are disconnected from God, you will be depressed. And so what does it mean? Reconnect. He'll take you back wherever you are. He'll take you right now. But that means you've got to make some purposeful choices about what you're listening to, how you're listening to it. Don't, be, don't um, just allow it to f uh, come in and out. Go spend time with it and dig in deep, okay? Um, memorize scripture. One of the best baby steps I can give you is to memorize scripture. Um, the Holy Spirit will remind you of things that you've taken the time to learn. And if you, re if you tuck scripture inside of you, it is much easier for the Holy Spirit to remind you of something that you've tucked inside. And when you go and look up passages of scripture on hurt and frustration, and despair, um, about what God promises to bring and the healing that he offers. If you memorize those things, when you get to that place and you cry out to the Lord, he will remind you. He will remind you of Psalm 100 if you've taken the time to memorize it. He'll remind you of passages that you've tucked inside of you. This was always God's intention for you to memorize scripture, to feast on his word and not just read it and go, well, that was nice, but to read it and tuck it away inside. Write it on a note card, paste it on your mirror, paste it in your car on the dashboard and look at it and look at it and look at it and look at it. Meditate on it, not transcendental meditation. Meditate on it where you review it and you go through it and you ask God, what does it mean for me? What do you want to teach me in this? Memorize it, tuck it inside so that when it's right timing, the Holy Spirit will go, don't forget that in this world you will have trouble, but take heart of overcome the world. And the Holy Spirit will remind you and teach you that when you need to hear it. And this will be a great way to heal from your depression. Uh, last couple of things. Quit distracting yourself. A lot of people say, I just need to distract myself. That is actually not what you need to do. I get it. I like to distract myself at times, but you need to quit thinking that distracting yourself will actually bring healing. Distracting yourself will be temporary. And again, sometimes a temporary numbness is nice, but I got to tell you, if you're distracting yourself with alcohol, you're going to hurt yourself because it is a depressant. Jennifer already said that. Um, it will harm you in the long run. 
if you are just looking at pills, uh, if you're looking to television to uh, distract you, if you're looking for people to distract you, um, you're, you're going to struggle. Your goal in healing is not distraction. Your goal in healing is for God to transform you from the inside out. Renew our whole thing comes out of Romans 12, 1 and 2. That is no longer be conformed to the world. Don't let the world shove you into its box, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That counts for depression too. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That as you practice spiritual disciplines, as you spend time with God, He will change your brain. He will work at it. And if you will cooperate, which is the hard part, God will do His part. Will I do my part? Will I cooperate with the Holy Spirit? Will I cooperate with God? Will I come into alignment with Him and allow Him to change me from the inside out? That's what metamorpheo means, transformation, as He changes the way that you think. But if you're just distracting yourself, you'll never be able to think rightly. Um, Practice gratitude is another baby step. Practice gratitude every day. Um, Write it down. When you get up in the morning, begin practicing gratitude for little things. Practice giving God thanks. Be gracious and, gra- and have gratitude in your heart for things like sunrises or a good cup of coffee. Have you ever thanked God for a good cup of coffee? I have. Um, in fact, it was more like, God, thank you for this coffee so I don't actually kill anyone right now. You know, a second cup would be great. Those sorts of things. You can have gratitude for any number of things, but practice gratitude. Write it down. When you get up in the morning, begin. Practice gratitude. Maybe it's something simple like thank you for a comfortable mattress or thank you for a good night's sleep for once or thank you for helping me to sleep all night without having to get up and pee in the middle of the night. You know, those are, kind of, those are real things, real things. The older I get, the more I'm thankful for that one. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and then last couple things. I'm going to give you homework. So I need you to get a piece of paper when you get home and draw a line down the middle. On one side, write joy. And on one side, write despair. And I want to challenge you to write down as many things as you can think of that bring you joy and write down the things that bring you despair. That's part one. Part two is to ask, how can I move things from despair to joy? Is there anything I can do to move this over and write it down? How do I move this from despair to joy? How can I take this circumstance and allow it to be something that I have joy in? How can I move it over? Now, a couple things. If your despair column is much bigger than your joy column, you need to call a psychologist this week. You hear me? You do. You need to go talk it out and give this to them and go, here's where I am. They'll love it if you bring this in. They'll be like, whoa, you just saved us two hours. Thank you. Uh, What amazing pastor told you to do that? You know, that kind of thing. Just kidding. (laughs) Write it out. Joy and despair. And then the third part. Everybody with me so far? Write it down. For the things in despair, is there anything I could do to move it over? This is part of that stacking thing. How do I take? These are stacks that create the stacks. How do I change these? If I can, guess what? There's going to be some things on here you cannot change. That's because we live in a sin-soaked world that is fallen and disgusting. And you're going to have to walk through crap sometimes. I'm sorry, but it's true. In this world, you will have trouble, Jesus promises. Take heart of overcome the world. There are going to be things you will never get off this list. I'm sorry. Now, there are going to be things that you can circle and go, I can, this is reality, but I don't have to walk in it. Does that make sense to you? It may stay over here, but it bleeds over into this column where I can, even in the middle of the greatest trial, I still can have joy in the Lord because joy and happiness are different. Happiness is circumstantial. Guess what? God never promises you're going to get to be happy. Once you figure that out, you'll be in better shape because our world says, nope, you're supposed to be happy. That is not true. And it's also not reality. There's enough joy in this world that makes us long for more But let me tell you, the place that you find more is in heaven. But don't short-circuit that either. 
We want to be there someday, but between now and then, we've got work to do, and you do too. The wounded healers, okay? There are going to be things you're never going to get quite off this list, but the goal is to bleed it over where you can still experience joy even in the middle of the trial, even in the middle of the darkness. This takes spiritual disciplines. It takes spending time with God, surrendering this to Him, asking Him to help you be in a joyful place regardless of what's on this list. That's important. So begin working on that. And then here's the last part of this. I want you to keep one of these around, maybe on your refrigerator. And when something comes up, you need to ask yourself, am I going to end up having to write this in my joy box or my despair box? So your friends call and go, hey, let's go out and drink tonight. You need to be really honest with yourself and go tomorrow, which, am I, which of those boxes am I going to have to write that in? Why would you write it in a despair box when you know you've got to unpack it later? That's silly. If someone says, um, let's go out to the buffet. We can distract ourselves from our frustrations. Which column are you going to have to write that in? You're going to have to write it somewhere. <laughs> Maybe joy for a time. But at the end, 30 30 <laughs> after 30 minutes, that Chinese buffet is going to make you sick. And you're going to end up despairing all night in the bathroom, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> I'm serious, listen, or you're starving to death 30 minutes. Ask yourself, is this going to bring me joy or is this going to bring me despair? And make choices that are intelligent. Ask God to show you and help you with that. And if you can get in the habit of asking, is this going to be something I got to write here? Or I'm going to have to write here and I got to unpack it later. Make a good choice. Make a good choice. Um, these are simple baby step things that you can do and you can do right now. All right, last thoughts. We're out of time. Last thoughts for you. You need accountability. Ask someone to be your accountability person. Be the person that you can go to 24-7, 365, 3 in the morning if you need to. Giving someone permission to call you out when you're in a dark place. And you could even tell them how to do it. You know you better than anybody. And if you know I call on you and I say, Chris, I need you. If you ever see me saying these kinds of things, I need you to come to my house and tell me you're coming with me, buddy. And we're going to go deal with this. I need to give you permission. And if I know how to overcome it, but I can't seem to in my depression get through it by, by myself, I've empowered someone else that has permission to come and do that for me and to bring me into that time. You need these people. People that will hold you accountable. People that will hold you accountable to this is important. Shine light in dark places. If you've got sin in your life that, is, that you have not dealt with, this is also one of the reasons why a lot of people are depressed. And you didn't talk about it earlier and I saved it for now. But if you've got some secret sin that's floating around in you, and you will not uncover it or you will not repent and deal with it, um, that is a reason a lot of people are depressed. Uh, because if you have that sinful place that you are continuing to visit and not dealing with, then um, it is hard to practice spiritual disciplines and you will end up empty and you will struggle. Uh, repent, make it a, a daily process in your prayer time to repent of places that you've gone you should not go whether it was physically or in your head in your brain and deal with those things shine light in dark places number three give yourself permission to not be depressed i know it sounds weird but if you're depressed right now you don't have to be depressed tomorrow so don't tell yourself well i'll just be depressed tomorrow give yourself permission to find healing give yourself permission to say Tomorrow I would love to be better and I will accept that. And if you're not, fine, then you have other things to work through. But give yourself permission to not stay depressed. It's okay. Um, by the way, if you're on medication for that and you start to feel better, don't stop taking the medication. <laughs> a lot of people do. They'll take medication, it takes a month for it to work, and you go, wow, I feel so much better. I don't want to kill anybody. I don't want to kill myself. I have hope again. So I'll stop taking the meds. I'm obviously better. No, it's probably the meds that helped you get there. Don't stop taking the meds, okay? This is important. Um, 
but give yourself permission to not be depressed. Number four, believe God can actually heal you. But you got to believe it's true. Do you think God is still in the miracle working business? I think so. I've seen God heal all sorts of things. Um, I really have. I have. It's a bigger story than we have time for. I've seen God heal um, tumors. I've seen God heal um, all sorts of marriages and brokenness in every way. I, I believe God can heal you, but you need to believe God can heal you. If you don't believe it's true, it probably will not happen. But if you believe that he can, because he can, then you need to continually take your thoughts captive. And when the devil lies to you, and if there's any kind of oppressive type thing coming against you, telling you, you will always feel this way, you need to fight back against that and say, I will not always feel this way. I will let God heal me and restore me knowing that you have ministry to do out of that. As God brings you comfort, you become the wounded healer to bring comfort. Sometimes our greatest trials are our greatest teacher and our greatest opportunity to create ministry that you'll be able to do that no one else can do, especially designed for it. And that's hard, but you can. Let me give you um, a couple last things. Pray with hope. Pray with hope consistently. Let me read Isaiah uh, 53, 5. It says this. I want you to memorize this. This is your absolute assignment. If you came tonight, memorize it. Recite it every day. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. You need to memorize it, my friends. I love you so much. You've got to do it. And then here's the other one. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 25. Write it down. Set it to memory. Here's what it says. Again, that's 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 25. For to this you have been called. Guess what? You are here for a reason tonight. And I think part of it is you have been called to be here and to find healing and restoration so that you can be the healer. I really believe that. That's why you're here. You may not think so. You may think it's just about you. And that is probably true for many of you that is about you and finding healing. But God has this way of working things where it's not just about us. That it is what God wants to do through us. So, let him do something through you. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Yes, even in suffering. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Pray believing that God can still heal you and bring you restoration and a new beginning and a new story. So tonight, that's what I've got for you. Um, we need to be done. We're over on time. I apologize. But uh, next week, don't miss Sunday. Invite your friends. We've got important things to talk about Sunday morning, and we'll be back here at 630 next Sunday night doing more on how to help lead somebody else through the seasons of darkness. And so hopefully you'll join us for that. All right, let me pray you out. Father, I pray that when we leave here, we are protected from the evil one who will want to lie to us and tell us that meant nothing. I pray that you shut his mouth, not allow him to speak another false word or half-truth to anyone in this place. I pray that you shut his mouth when he tells us that we are not worthy. In our flesh, we're not, but Christ is worthy and calls us to walk in his steps. And you make us right and righteous as we follow you and surrender our life to you. 
shut the devil's mouth when he tells us this was a waste of time. But I pray that you will help us to become a student of this and to grow and to learn and to become the men and women you call us to be. I pray that you really help us to become the wounded healers and that we will see with new eyes people around us that are struggling and that we will not just say, what a shame, but instead we will engage and love and lead in the way that you've trained us and taught us how. Bring us comfort so that we can comfort others with the same comfort you've given. And I pray now in the name of Jesus that you heal the sadness of the soul, that you heal the grief in this room, that you heal the brokenness, that you heal the depression, that you heal the anxiety in a mighty and powerful way. And if we wake up tomorrow sad, you've given us tools to work through it. Help us to strengthen ourselves in you in every way. It is by the power and authority of Jesus that we pray. Amen.